I'd like to welcome all of you back to the Driving Institutional Change for Research Assessment Meeting hosted here at HHMI and also co-sponsored by DORA. We're just absolutely thrilled to be back in the auditorium with all of you this morning. And for all of you that are out on our live feed, welcome back as well. So we have a really exciting panel this morning. I had a chance to talk with all of them in advance, so I know that you're going to hear a number of interesting stories. So what we're going to learn about this morning is how a number of institutions have adopted research, new research assessment practices. So each one of these institutions has taken a different approach, has taken a different um, uh, feel to it, and, and I think it's all a little bit of a work in progress. So um, we'll hear a little bit also about what they sort of see to the future and challenges. But what I'd like to do is just kick it off by having each one of them um, just go down the line. And if we could get your name, your affiliation, and your role at your institution, that would be great. And I'll start with Stephen. Uh, hi, my name is Stephen. So I work at Imperial College in London, not University College London, which uh, some people confuse it with, but that's okay. Uh, and uh, I have worked there for nearly 24 years and sort of started as a lecturer. So I'm now a professor of structural biology. But most of my time now is devoted to my role as assistant professor for equality, diversity, and inclusion. Sounds nice. <laughs> Um, my name is Frank Miedema, Frank Miedema, they say here, uh, since I was uh, many times in the United States for HIV AIDS research, Frank Miedema. And I'm now a, a vice rector of research and chair of the open science program of Utrecht University. Before that, until March lately, I uh, was for 10 years the dean of the medical faculty. And this is probably why I'm here today. I'm Sandra Schmid, my friends call me Sandy. Uh, I'm chair of the cell biology department at UT Southwestern where I've been for about seven and a half years. Prior to that, I was chair of the cell biology department at the Scripps Research Institute in La Jolla for uh, 10 years or so. So I've done this a long time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my name is Miriam Kipp. I'm from the Berlin Institute of Health, the Quest Center for Transforming Biomedical Research. Uh, the BIH uh, Corp has two corporate institutions. One is the Charité um, University Hospital, which is one of the biggest uh, university hospitals in Europe. I'm at Quest um, involved in the area of incentives and indicators, and we advise and consult the Charité on these issues. Hi, my name is Omar Quintero. I'm an associate professor of biology at the University of Richmond, um, and I guess some of the things that we've done in our institution have been really thinking about um, procedures and guidelines and what we do to set up for successful searches to meet institutional goals as they relate to inclusion and diversity. Um, my name is Nidhi Bala. I'm a professor in the Molecular Cell and Developmental Biology Department at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Well, welcome to all of you. So we're just going to start by um, finding out what your institutions have done. So we'll just go down the row, and if you could tell us what the most significant and effective change to research as assessment has, that has been made at your institution. And maybe we'll start at the opposite end this time with Needy. You can start us off. So what, what has your institution done in this area? So um, in my institution, we're primarily concerned with making sure that there's transparency, accountability, and consistency in research assessment. And so, and um, that we also address diversity and inclusion in our hiring and promotion practices. And so two of the things that I think that we've done that are um, maybe some people have done and, and it's a little bit different than other people have done is, is that assistant professors in our department vote on tenure. And so assistant professors actually observe the conversations that happen about tenure and they vote on the process, they actually vote on their senior colleagues' tenure. And so it's an opportunity for um, assistant professors to actually um, participate in the process, observe the process, and it contributes to transparency and accountability because there's an opportunity to actually see how everything works before they actually come up for tenure themselves. And then the second thing that we've done, which I think is incredibly powerful, is, is that we've started using diversity statements early in the assessment process for hiring. And that has been incredibly powerful because it allows for a more holistic evaluation of um, faculty candidates. It, um, it shows that we value diversity and inclusivity, and it's actually a potential way to move the needle on hiring underrepresented minorities as faculty members, because despite the fact that underrepresented minorities have grown as trainees, they, that growth has not been seen at the level of faculty hiring, and that is a complete deficit in our faculty hiring process and in our promotion practices. 
right? Okay. So um, at University of Richmond, we've done, I guess, historically two things. The first was that our um, department decided to spell out and write a set of search procedures that address how decisions are made at particular decision-making steps. So I can talk about it later, but if the decision is being made about a group or a cohort in the pool, the data that you use are about the group and the cohort, not about individuals. And then if decisions are being made about individuals, the data you use are about that particular individual. So it changes some of the dynamics of how a search runs. Um, layered on top of that, our arts and science and dean's office asked all of the departments to put together a career profile that described what we imagined successful colleagues in our department to do in terms of research and service and teaching. So, and that document both informs how we search and also informs um, what the Tenure and Promotions Committee does because each department, when they put someone up for tenure, sends that document along with the rest of the tenure packet. Okay, so on the premise that um, robust and reproducible research are the fundaments of patient-oriented translation, which, one, which is one of BIH and also the Charité's core missions, and the BIH Charité took the task and to change the way um, how they assess research, and since 2017, 2018, robustness and reproducibility indicators are an integral part um, of the incentive structures. And our work was um, particularly there to implement those and um, raise awareness on robustness and reproducibility indicators in exchange maybe to less adequate ones. And in the area of hiring professors, um, five items were um, additionally um, introduced to the existing application forms. And one is the narrative on the overall scientific contributions, um, so-called impact story of the applicants, the top five publications or contributions with the respective impact of each. The third is a record of the candidate's open size and reproducibility research. Um, the fourth, information also as a narrative on the candidate's contributions to team science. And last, academic age calculation. So how do we know now that these criteria are not only there on paper, just lingering around on the, in the deep depth of the uh, server of Charité, and they're actually adopted into the assessment practice? So Merit Prof is a project that I would like to talk with you and discuss with you today. It's a policy implementation project that exactly evaluates and uh, follows up on the implementation steps in order to uh, improve the assessment. And the activity so far has been that we have a seat in the hiring commissions and we observe and when those items are not uh, brought up during discussions or candidates are not asked, um, we will suggest to ask these questions. And sometimes we are allowed to ask questions ourselves and other times we will refer the question to hiring commission members to make sure that those items slowly but steadily get part of the assessment practice. And at the same time, we work on a format um, to, that helps to synthesize and extract the relevant information in an accessible way. Imagine 50 candidates with 15 narratives now <coughs> times three. Um, that is not necessarily a pragmatic way for assessment of large cohorts or large fields. And we are trying to work together with qualitative researchers, with data science, with data mining, text mining, to find a format to make this qualitative assessment more accessible. Wonderful. Thank you. Sandy. So uh, uh, with regard to hiring at UT Southwestern, like many of our uh, large <coughs> medical centers, there's a lot of autonomy within each department. So I can only speak to my own department, although some of the things we started are being now uh, adopted by other departments. So uh, I uh, don't have a search committee. Rather, I engaged my entire department in looking for new uh, faculty. We use the academic job site. Uh, everybody in the faculty gets assigned three letters of the alphabet with three faculty members on all of those, so lots of eyes on these applications. Uh, we ask specifically in their uh, cover letter to tell us what it is you've done that's significant as a graduate student, as a postdoc, and, and, and succinctly what your plans are and how UT Southwestern fits into this. Um, it takes only one faculty member to recommend a Skype interview. And so we Skype interview as many as 30 
uh, candidates. Uh, 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 again, in a group of three or four people, we give the candidates the Skype questions ahead of time. And I also give them permission uh, to email me or call me if you have any questions. We want them to be relaxed. We want to see the best uh, of what they are. We don't want the shy person to suffer from the gre uh, uh, Gregorious person. So a lot of help in, in making sure that we get the most opportunities to, to see who these people will be uh, as, as potential uh, colleagues. And then we uh, bring in uh, four or three or four candidates that we agree on uh, as, uh, are going to be the strongest. When we decide on those uh, four candidates, I appoint an advocate from my faculty for each candidate. So there's one person who's in charge of making that candidate their favorite uh, and advocating for all of the eight or ten faculty we're going to discuss. Uh, and so everybody has an advocate, somebody that's prepared to speak to the strengths of that person. So that's how we do our um, our, our, our recruitment now, I think it's increased our diversity. I think it's uh, given opportunities for people that might not have, you know, di to find the diamond in the rough, and, uh, uh, you know, that seems to be working. Uh, one thing about tenure that I think UT Southwestern does, which is now institutionally, which I think UT Southwestern does uniquely, is rather than soliciting letters of recommendation, uh, our uh, uh, promotions and tenure committee actually get on the phone uh, to uh, at least a half a dozen of your colleagues. So I was the one that wrote up there, ask your peers or talk to the peers. So these uh, uh, faculty and uh, promote or tenure and promotion committee members get on the phone to your peers and ask you, what is your reputation in the in the in the in the in your field? You know, have you made important contributions and significant contributions in your field? Are you considered to be a leader? Are you respected? So I think that's a, a unique uh, system that UT Southwestern goes to. Fabulous, great, Frank. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, inviting me to be here. It's an honor. Um, uh, before I say uh, what was a significant step, I think I have to do some little bit of history. Um, uh, as a dean uh, in, in the medical faculty, I, I started in 2013, 12, 13. We started with a small group of people, a little movement, which is called Science in Transition, to be found on the internet. And uh, we uh, were analyzing and, and, uh, and, uh, and criticizing science for uh, the problems that we all saw, the problems that we have been discussing yesterday evening and have been discussed, say, broadly. Um, we found that, indeed, uh, exactly the DORA analysis, it was a, uh, the, the re incentive and reward system was playing against us. It, it was against, uh, say, uh, people who did um, uh, less of the hard sciences, did more quali qualitative studies like prevention, uh, studies on healthcare, health health uh, um, healthcare, uh, say in innovation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, the, the the system was totally dri driving to basic science, and in fact, uh, it, it looked like the further from the patient you are, the smarter you are. So uh, it was rewarded to do more basic stuff compared to solving clinical needs. Because the system, as we found, and this is not only in my, in my medical center, but in also in an international context, we found that this system was, was at the expense of, say, solving uh, problems with huge clinical needs and that, that, that were just not scoring in this type of metrics. And this is the real problem, and this is also my driver. So we have to make it, the incentive reward system more inclusive, so that also people do do, do prevention or public health can also be say uh, awarded, uh, and, and because they also have excellence. And this is uh, this is also ex uh, extremely important for HSMI, I think. Um, um, coming to this conclusion and starting to talk about it and, and to criticize science, people said to me, well, uh, you're, you're the dean of a large medical center. There were 12, there at, at this point in time, in Utrecht, Utrecht Medical Center, 1,200 PhDs working on a thesis. Uh, so people say, if you're the dean, clean first, clean up your own mess at your own house. <laughs> and, uh, and I, of course, felt very Calvinistic, so this is what I did. <laughs> and uh, this makes you laugh, right? Eh? Uh, it can also be a problem, I can tell you. <laughs> so what happened, I, uh, we decided uh, in the board, because I was with two, uh, say, female, say, uh, co uh, uh, colleagues in the board, and they were totally with us, and they were with science in decision, and they said, now, okay, go, go, and uh, so what I did, I asked a group uh, of young, mid-career scientists, uh, a nice mix of uh, female, male, and uh, to think about, and also a mix of basic and more applied science, and we asked the question to them from the board, Give us a scheme of indicators, 
uh, um, qualifiers that you want to be judged uh, on. So how do you want to be judged? That was the basic question. And make it generic, et cetera, et cetera. We didn't interfere, and this was the only thing I did. And we just, the committee was, was being formed, and one of our, say, policymakers was sitting in as a secretary. Later on, I will tell you what happened, but uh, we stayed away from it, and this was really the group. And the group, of course, started to talk in the, in the medical center. There are 12,000 people where there's a lot of things going on. And, of course, they were, they were meeting, say, very positive, say, comments, but also resistance, etc. So, and eventually, they brought the advice to the board, and the only thing we did is we took the advice and we said, this is a wonderful proposal. It's generic. It's, it's, it, it takes into account also discussions with patients, etc., etc., so we loved it, and we said, this is what we're going to, going to do. And we're going to do pilots in UMC Utrecht see, and to see how this system is, is uh, say, uh, panning out in, in the real. This is what we and, and of course, this is, this, I think the most significant step was that we decided to have other people in a group decide on how they wanted to be judged from different departments, surgery, <laughs> biomedical, cancer research, and molecular biology, immunologists like my background. And I think that has helped us a lot. Because it was not me or the board, but it was these people, and they, and they had talked to a lot of people before they came and, and con, con, came to this advice. Very good. So we heard a lot about process, and we are going to go back down the line and hear everybody's process as well. But we'll first hear what they're doing at Imperial College. So Stephen, what, what have you put into effect there? Uh, well, so one of the most significant changes in our approach to research and researcher assessment at Imperial happened in, um, because of a suicide. We had a member of staff, a professor of, uh, in the faculty of medicine who took his own life. And although one can never be sure quite what is, uh, someone is thinking when they reach such an extreme state, it was fairly clear from subsequent investigations that it was the pressure of performance assessment as encoded in our faculty of medicine that was a major uh, factor in that. And if you look at the documents that were used at the time in terms of assessing um, faculty in the, in the Faculty of Medicine, uh, number one was grant income. And there were sort of targets set then, depending on your level. And it was the highest for uh, professorial staff. And number two was publication in the right journals. And the document had an addendum, uh, which ran to 65 pages, uh, which listed all of the major journals in all of the different subfields of medicine and give their impact factor as well. And the one with the highest impact factor was highlighted in yellow, in case you didn't get the message. <laughs> and uh, at the very bottom of it, it was, you know, do a little bit of teaching and keep your nose clean. And uh, this awful, tragic incident sort of uh, shocked and horrified lots of people. Um, but in some ways, it wasn't a surprise, because that is the sorts of pressures that I think we see in a hyper-competitive system. But one of the, uh, it was lots of reviews about the, the particular way of that this person had been managed. Uh, but there was also uh, uh, pressure to review actually how the whole university uses metrics in performance assessment. And I was uh, part of the review group that, that was met and convened under Professor Stephen Richardson, who was from the Faculty of Engineering. And that review came out with a recommendation which was adopted across the university, which was to look at uh, not to abandon the use of profile uh, of, of performance metrics completely. There's recognition that some measure of quantitative information is a useful factor in looking at what people do. But it was to very deliberately broaden out the scope of how we assess people. And so, yes, we are interested in people who are doing really good and groundbreaking research. But we're also interested in uh, staff who are good teachers and who are able to step up to deliver you know, high quality courses to our undergraduate and postgraduate students. We're, we were explicitly trying to recognize departmental citizenship, those people who sit on uh, you know, genes, uh, genetic safety committees and, and step up to be head of department from time to time, as well as then other uh, sort of outreach activities, work to help develop or advise government on policy. So there was very a deliberate attempt to sort of provide a matrix and a profile and a very strong message that we don't expect, expect everybody to excel in every dimension. And we, we agree that you know, from, from time to time, people may be focusing a bit more on their research or a bit more on their teaching, and that that is fine. Okay? Now, that document was recommended and is now going out and being implemented by different faculties. Now, it's one thing to write a document. It's quite another to implement it. And so that is, I would have to say, so that process happened in sort of 2014-15. 
It laid important groundwork for us eventually to sign DORA, which we'll come on to later in the discussion. Uh, but these are important debates and discussions and processes that I think help to move the journey um, along. And so I would say that there's much greater recognition of the broader swathe of academic um, achievements. There is still quite a focus on research productivity, and I think that's still problematic for us, but that's certainly been a big change. Wonderful. So we can see that there's a real range of where people are placing emphasis. You know, we've heard about diversity. We've heard about um, open research, um, looking at different aspects of the sort of three-legged stool of service, teaching, and, and research at some of the institutions. Um, but now I'd like to talk a little bit, learn a little bit more about the process. We heard a little bit from Stephen and Frank about their process, but I want to give you a chance to, to delve into that a little bit more. So if you we can go back down the line and sort of talk about how you arrived at these new approaches to um, the promotion and tenure or the hiring. Um, you know, who was involved? Was it really top down? Was it bottom up? And then kind of how long did it take? Stephen already said this is a years long process that you've been working on since the policies came along in 2014 and I'm sure they didn't just arrive whole cloth. Um, so maybe we go start with Stephen. You can maybe elaborate a little bit more um, about the process that kind of led to uh, the new approach that you've taken. Okay, so um, so as I said, the sort of the review and the introduction of these sort of performance profiles uh, helped lay some important groundwork. And um, around that time, I had already started having conversations with our provost uh, about whether or not the institution was up for signing DORA uh, in order to sort of promote um, um, a much healthier approach to research assessment. And he was supportive, although he did tell me he was a big fan of the H index, uh, but he was a physicist by, uh, by background, so I guess that helps to explain that a little bit. But he was supportive, but, but he basically put it on me to sort of go around and talk to the different faculties to, uh, to try and convince them to sign up. And I managed to persuade my own faculty, which is natural sciences, they, uh, they agreed. I had a sympathetic hearing from the engineers who then came, turned around to me and said, well, actually, we think we know what the best journals are. I mean, you know, we, we're kind of comfortable with, uh, with doing that. I didn't get around to talking to the Faculty of Medicine because this case with our professor, Stefan Grimm, um, um, erupted. And so I ran into the sand a little bit. Uh, and things got moving again, actually, because we appointed a new vice provost for research, so Professor Nick Jennings, who actually came, comes from a computer science software background, and he was very much into open science and very much pro dora and sort of arrived at the institution and said, well, you know, why haven't, we, why haven't we signed yet? So I hooked up very quickly with him, thanks uh, in part to our director of library uh, services, uh, Chris Banks, uh, who's very active uh, in this space. And actually it was Nick who was able to bang heads together that I hadn't been able to, uh, uh, to force together. Um, he did ask me things like, well, you know, who, who, which of the Ivy League uh, universities have signed? You know, because um, that's one of the things that strikes me about so-called world-leading universities. They like, to, they like other people to be slightly further in front before they will <laughs> uh, assume a position of leadership. And so, uh, so there weren't any Ivy League uh, universities that I could uh, point to. But even so, uh, we sort of made a case and it was put to the university and uh, we, we, we eventually signed. Now we may have signed somewhat prematurely because it was an indication of a commitment and my own personal view is that it's actually, it's okay for universities to sign and demonstrate the commitment before they're quite ready as long as they're honest and transparent about that. Mm -hmm. And we did then set up a working group uh, to look at uh, you know, sort of the paperwork and procedures, and so we have made a very deliberate effort to change the wording of job descriptions and adverts that we post. We created a piece of boilerplate text uh, basically declaring that you know, we are signatures of DORA and what that means, and it meant, I mean, a lot of the changes were relatively subtle. It was, you know, take out wording like, you know, a record of publication in top journals and, and talk about a record of, you know, publishing and performing uh, world-leading research, you know, again, it's, it's really a, a subtle shift of focus from the venue to actually the, the content of the research. And 
so we now also have a, a web page, which I know that a lot of institutions, it's kind of, it seems like a pretty basic step that you would sign DORA and then you would tell the world that you'd yeah. signed DORA yeah. and tell your own faculty that you'd signed it's DORA. Scary. Scary. And the number of universities that have signed but nobody knows is really quite <laughs> astonishing. So which we definitely have a web page on it. Yeah. We also hosted a sort of one day workshop uh, with invited speakers to talk about you know, what, what DORA meant for us as an institution and what the challenges of research assessment were. And uh, we had about 100 people come along to that. Now, we are a university that has over 4,000 academic staff, so it was well short of uh, everybody. And so uh, that was when, that was in September last year. And so we have started to reach out and we are, but we recognize that this is a message we have to keep telling over and over again because uh, I would, Im I would imagine that, although a lot of people know at Imperial that we have signed and what that's supposed to mean, there's maybe in some cases a somewhat reluctant acceptance of that. But even so then, not everybody yet knows. And I, I'm sure there will be committee rooms and promotion discussions where people talk about, you know, so-and-so is ready for it because they got a, a big paper last year or they brought in a huge grant and, you know, that's the end of the conversation. So it's some, it's, you know, it has to be a work in progress. Um, and the reason I, you know, I like the fact that we are public about it because that, to me, that empowers faculty on the ground. So if they see something happening or if they hear a conversation that is about, you know, publishing in nature, cell science, et cetera, and that being the major reason, they can challenge it and they can call it out. And, uh, and so to me, it's about empowering staff to do that um, and being, you know, transparent about it. Very good. So Frank, um, you talked a little bit about you're, you're kind of top down, but then you got the, the bottom up to kind of work yeah. with you. And so maybe in about three minutes, you can sort of so, summarize where it went yeah, from there. Maybe so, so what is, um, I think what, what you have to, what, what we realized and what you have to realize is if you do this type of, say, interventions, because it's really an intervention, because this intervention of incentive rewards is affecting the distribution of reputation and eventually also monies. And in committees, people realize this. So I think uh, what we realized is that uh, we had to really think through um, so um, what, is, what, it, what it really did, would do to, the, uh, to, our, uh, to our staff and also to the system, so to also to the, the setting of our agenda of, of research, which I alluded to before. So um, I can give you an example. So when we started to do this and we, we said, yeah, we are going to have this set of indicators which are generic and this, of course, is impact and uh, everything that has been dis discussed before. And people said, yeah, hmm, uh, Frank, but, but uh, the quality of our, of our research is, will now go down. Because, uh, so we were always rewarding the excellent people, and now we are uh, rewarding people that we, say, a, a year or two ago in the old system, didn't find that really excellent, say, uh, that they were so really excellent. And this is really happening in town hall meetings, uh, so I can be free about it. And, of course, we had to realize, say, where is this assistance coming from? Where is this, this these, these, there were also people with very genuine, say, worries about can this be sustained and are we not front runner and will not Amsterdam and Leiden be in front of us because they will do the old game, like what has been explained by your vice rector or, or provost. And so I think the, the hardest thing for me personally, but also for people around me was to be patient and to listen very closely to what people were bringing as worries and concerns and to not say um, label and frame everything as resistance as people that just didn't want to go along with you. And because that is, of course, the, if you are very, say, fired up, the, if somebody says, yeah, but this is, uh, so what about excellence? Then, of course, the, the, the first thing you do is, huh, uh, you're against me. And this is something you really have to get out. And what we get out about, because we started to analyze, we started to think, we started to discuss in groups about what does it mean? How does the system work? So go into the deep for motivations and say, why do people want to be in nature and in science and cell? Because they think that this is because they were, they, they, they were doing good research and not the other way around. So this is really important. And um, I think that um, and yeah, this takes time. It takes time and you also need groups of people who can also say, warn you as a dean or as somebody who is in discussing, warn you to have to listen and to be patient and to take and take also the time to do it because this is not something you signing door is nothing. It's changing the culture, changing the way people think about science, thinking about excellence, extremely important. I will finish off by my favorite ex uh, say example. You can do excellent research on how stroke is, is say coming about, pathogenesis of stroke. It, it biologically very interesting, also immunological processes there by the way, and. 
But most people survive stroke, and now they are in a rehabilitation center. And so, and if you don't talk anymore, and if you are paralyzed, then you realize who is going to get me on my feet again? Who can teach me to, to talk again? I, I can tell you, the only thing I can do is talk. I'm very good at it. But you're scared to death if you are uh, after a stroke and you're, you're, you're in, in handicapped in, in, in your speech. And so, is there top-notch, excellent research, and are we driving people to go in that type of, say, careers? Uh, well, the metrics that we had before didn't do it. Amen. <laughs> Very good. All right, so Sandy, tell us a little bit about your process. So uh, in my first year at UT Southwestern, having been recruited as a chair and been shown a lot of empty lab space that I got to fill up, uh, mm -hmm. I did what everybody did. You put an ad out, you get 300 applications. I had a committee that looked at those applications. Of course, I looked at them all. And, um, and, and we chose uh, you know, three or four people we could afford to bring in and spend a whole two days interviewing. And we made two offers, and those people were also brought into every other major medical school in the country, and they went someplace else. And that happened uh, for uh, 10 out of 12 offers that the university made university-wide. I said, this, you know, we can't keep doing this. That's crazy. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I thought, you know, if you, if you get a committee together and you tell them they can only order one flavor of ice cream for the party, and they have to decide by consensus what flavor of ice cream they're going to order, we're going to have a lot of vanilla ice cream at our parties. <laughs> and that's what we did. We invited a bunch of vanilla people, and everybody else invited the same vanilla people, and we ended up empty-handed. And so I realized we have to do something different. At the same time, I was one of the original co-authors of the DORA uh, petition. I said, OK, well, let's put this two together. And so I wrote the employer's manifesto. Um, I credit my son with the title. <laughs> uh, really, he read it and said, that's what God is. But you know, where we really tried to do something in a, in a CV-less, you know, a little bit facetious, but a CV-less search, really make that cover letter important, get all eyes on it, have a very, very low bar for getting to meet that person. And you know, who's the right person for your department? The right person for my, depart for my department, the person that's going to be successful in my environment, is not the same person that's going to be successful in your environment. There is no best person. There's the right person for the environment, for the opportunity, where are the collaborations going to come from, what are the resources, uh, what, what uh, core facilities are going to make that person's research be better here than it would be there. And you have to meet the people, you have to ask them about their future plans, you have to ask them. One of our questions in Skype is, you know, we asked two questions, where do you want to be in five years and how can UT Southwestern help you get there? Because it's that second question that says that this is the place where they're going to be, their program is going to be so much stronger than, than anywhere else. And, and when you can make that point, when that's clear to my department, and it's also clear to the candidate, then we got them. Then we can bring them in, and, or her, uh, of course. And, and um, you know, so that's the change we made. And I, I think it's made a difference in our uh, uh, success in recruitment, and m most importantly, the success of the young faculty that we recruit. Very good. So yeah, so my perspective is slightly different. I'm not a professor. Um, everything we do is bottom up. So I cannot, I have no position or authority to say something, people will follow up or create something and then it's done the way I want it to be. But we are in the lucky position that we have a mandate um, to bring topics like robustness, reproducibility, open science to the Charité and also to parts of the Helmholtz Society, the MDC, the Max Delbrück Center. So a lot of our work has been participatory, I would say, field work lobby work on these topics. We attend um, certain, we attend all the intramural funding schemes, board meetings, um, be before that lobby them to allow us to be there to assess their work. Um, we created and developed certain sets of criteria that reflect robustness and reproducibility. We got the CEO and the board of the BIH and Charité to adapt them into all the uh, funding schemes. We got them to uh, finance open data as a new uh, indicator in the intramural, uh, in the um, um, performance-based funding scheme for all Charité researchers. 
and it's the same here. So the past one to two years have mainly been sitting, listening, observing, and talking to people, and slowly getting to understand the formal. There's a lot of formal processes, but a lot of informal as well. And we think we, this helped us to build a basis and to build trust, and at the same time that our measurement, that our intervention is responsive to the needs and the requirements of the field and the, the capacities that are there. <coughs> Yeah, so I would say this is the, the major part of the, of the activities and the processes. The hurdles are, of course, my position. I'm not a faculty, I'm not a professor. So even though we, when we discuss on a meta, let's say, um, level and um, robustness and reproducibility, uh, immediate reaction is, and I don't allude to the predominant opinion who, what this person maybe is about, the, it, goes against the person. So they would tell me, well, are you really allowed to speak here? Or um, maybe, uh, yeah. So that is kind of a typical, I would say, um, downside of us being um, a bottom-up approach. But we have the support of the dean. And if all things go wrong, we then have there a good uh, partner to talk to. Yeah. Very good. So bottom-up with sort of support from the top to give you that. Yes. No, otherwise it would not work sure. at all. Yeah. No. Omar. So um, let me tell you a little bit about what University of Richmond is like. So University of Richmond is a, I guess we describe ourselves as an undergraduate liberal arts university. So it's a college of arts and sciences and four other associated colleges where research expectation is part of the game. So you're expected to do research, you're expected to include your undergraduates in it. Our research labs in the biology department are staffed entirely by undergraduates. So I was hired at the time by a dean that was thinking about these sorts of things. And one of the things that she suggested to the departments was when you, you do searches, when you're first talking about the short lists or the medium lists, you're going to talk about and you're going to report back to the dean the strengths of all the candidates. So that forced the conversation to be about strengths and not about picking apart somebody else's um, missing characteristics. And one thing that was happening at the same time is you know, we would have a discussion about a search that we wanted to have. And we would have the discussion, the ad would get written, the, you would go through the search procedure that we had that was never really written down, it was just sort of what was. And the nature and tone of what the intended position to be filled was changed over time. Um, and some people would remember it one way and some people would remember it another way. So the, a lot of people ended up not quite satisfied with the process. So what we decided to do was to structure the process in a way that made it transparent internally what we were looking for and in some ways also transparent to uh, the candidates what we were looking for and also created some structure to account for favorites and bias at decision-making steps. So we have a conversation about what the job is that we want to fill. And then in the job ad, we would write that out, but we'd also tell the candidates what it is that we're evaluating and how much it counts. So at Richmond, um, we value scholarship that fits our particular set of resources that includes undergraduates teaching that is evidence-based and includes some scholarship in the teaching and an interest and maybe a track record in building supportive and inclusive environments. So those three things are in our job ads now. And after those three things are listed is a sentence that says, we value these things equally and this is what you will be assessed on. Um, so then we set up a procedure that um, allows you to make some decisions about groups. So, um, a typical search for us brings in 100 to 200 applicants. A small committee reads those and narrows it down to 11. The entire department reads those 11 to 12. And then when you're deciding on who of those 11 to 12 um, move on to the list of people that you interview, you make a decision on who those three or four people are based on the entire swath of the entire population of the 11 to 12. So, at some point in the search, each person gets to suggest three people that they would want to interview. 
those numbers get tallied, and then that entire set of data gets reported back to the department, but with candidate identities removed. So you'll, you might see a distribution where you've got 12 candidates, and there's decent support for nine of them, and not a lot of support for three. The department then decides whether or not that looks like a set of data where maybe you should remove those last three, look at who's left in the nine, rediscuss, and then revote. Um, the other situation could happen as well, where you might have three or four standouts and okay support for everybody else, and you decide who's going to get, who's going to move on um, based on that distribution. Um, then when you get to the point where you're deciding about individual candidates on who should get offers, the decision isn't of the four candidates that came to interview, who is the best? The decision is of the four can of each for each candidate who came to interview, who would make an outstanding potential colleague. So each of those votes is individual. Um, the order of the offers then gets decided by the dean. So the department is deciding on each candidate individually when it's an individual thing, on the pool when it's a decision about um, all of the applicants, and that changes what the discussion is like um, because it's focused on um, what it is that you're really trying to get at that particular moment. Because you're, everybody has said it, there's not one best candidate. In a pool of 200 people, there might be 10 people that would be amazing colleagues. So why set up a competition that doesn't necessarily need to be there? Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so the, um, the issue with assistant professors voting on tenure, that was there before I even joined the department. It was a decision that was made by senior colleagues um, because I think there was a sense, and this is a conversation that comes up multiple times during faculty meeting actually, there's a deliberate attempt to include early career professors in decision making because the realization is, is that these are the professors that will be there in the department longer and will be having to manage what's going to come net forward, come in the future. And so they're the ones most heavily invested in the decision making. And I'm. When I joined the faculty at UCSC at, in the MCD department, I actually did not realize that this was not the norm. And so when I <laughs> talk to people, when I talk to people about how tenure decisions are made, and I mention that assistant professors vote on tenure, I'm actually, it's surprising to me that more departments don't do this. It seems a very, very clear way to make it transparent and consistent, and to demonstrate that tenure is not a moving target, that there are, there, that there are clear criteria, and that the discussion reinforces those clear criteria. Um, the issue of diversity statements is, is that um, that was a top-down decision. Um, I think that the um, administrators, administrators at UC and administrator, administrators, sorry, I can't talk, um, at UCSC sort of said that this was a priority, but they never provided guidance on implementation. And so then the issue became, if you were not someone who was well-versed well in what that would mean, or you did not have a sense of what that would mean, there was no real way to evaluate diversity statements. There was no real way to know how that should be factored into the decision making. And so what that really took was somebody saying, somebody deliberately educating themselves about what diversity statements should address, how diversity statements should be involved in the process, and um, at what stages in promotion and tenure diversity statements should be involved in the process. And so that means that somebody's really got to take the initiative in the department to educate themselves on that, and that is not going to happen in a lot of departments unless there's a real priority to address that. And, and to tell you the truth, I think that's a, um, a huge failing in academic departments, this expectation that people should step up to the plate because if something is not a priority for that department, people are not going to step up to the plate. Um, and I would just like to add one thing that I did not mention before. We actually use Sandy Schmidt's criteria for um, assessment um, in the cover letter. So describe your major contribution during grad school, describe your major contribution during postdoc, and describe what your future plans are and how UCSC and MCD fits into that. And that has shifted the emphasis from research quantity to research quality, which I think is incredibly important. <laughs> The other thing that we have done is we have started asking the leadership question during the search process. Because this deficit in departments where we are 
evaluating research, but then we expect faculty to take on all of these additional roles after they become faculty. And, and so I mentioned that a, a, a major problem with diversity statements is, is that you need to have someone invested in educating themselves and in educating their colleagues about how to use diversity statements. If you are not selecting for leadership in the hiring process, you are not selecting for people who will take on those roles. And so during our Skype interviews, because we also use Skype interviews, thank you for that suggestion, one of, we have five questions. All, five, all candidates, which are normally on the order of anywhere from 12 to 18 in this first round of evaluation, get the same five questions. And one of those questions is, can you provide an example or several examples of leadership that you have participated in or that you've demonstrated as a postdoc or a graduate student? We don't value you know, amorphous leadership we value concrete examples of leadership, right? And so those are opportunities for people to demonstrate that they have contributed to their community, that they see themselves as a part, or a part of a wider community in science, and that that is something can, that can then potentially be translated into their participation in the department as service and pushing their department forward in a way or changing their department. And so I think this one thing that we absolutely have to recognize, and I think this comes out of Stephen's point about widening our sense of assessment, is, is that when people become faculty, the roles that they take on are much wider than they are initially trained on, and so our selection process should value those things and select for those things. Wonderful. So you can see uh, there's a really rich selection of examples up here. I mean, you know, in a lot of talk, about the values of the department being thoughtful. We see both policies and practice being put into effect. What I'd love to do is open the floor because I'm sure you have some questions. Um, please make them questions rather than comments. I know we had some options last night, but we, were, we are looking for questions today um, because we, have, we do want to sort of give the panel a chance to talk and take advantage of their knowledge here. If you could give your name and affiliation before you ask the question, I would very much appreciate that. And I believe we have also people can do questions from the interweb, is that correct, Anna? So we will also be taking questions from out on the interwebs. If you would like to send those in, there'll be someone here that can read them out. And then we have a Chris in the back there, so you identify yourself. Called Rescuing Biomedical Research. And I'm wondering, you all gave some good examples of hurdles you had to overcome, but I was wondering if you could give some maybe more concrete examples of specific roadblocks that were met either because of faculty in the department or administrators. Um, and I. You know, we don't necessarily need to go down the whole panel, but if we get one response from you know, the left side, the, the more administrative uh, <laughs> senior side, and one from the right side where you're more the, you know, the rank and file faculty. Yeah, that's good. Maybe if a couple of you could talk about roadblocks if you think you had a particularly challenging one. So, I don't know. Frank, you maybe mentioned yeah, a little course, bit there. Yeah, of course. Of uh, course. I think they, they are there, definitely. And I think also what the, the gentleman yesterday was asking to um, Bodo is, yeah, okay, you have the feeling in the boardroom that everything is okay, but if you go in departments, then people start to complain. And we did a lot of talking because of other reasons uh, and having lunches and dinners with, with say, selected uh, groups of, uh, of coll uh, coll uh, colleagues, and they were complaining us. They say, yeah, you have the idea that everything is bright and that they have now this new system with the portfolio and diversity and inclusiveness. But in my department, and then, of course, I drove, drove home and, and, and broke out in tears. Uh, because this is, this is what you hear all the time. So in a large system, and even it, in your system, I look at Bodo, uh, sorry, and in every system there is, of course, people are waiting, and they think uh, this dean has only one more year to go, and then we go back to normal. <laughs> I heard that many times, and, and, and this made me stay on until 10 years. And, and so now, of course, people say, ah, oh, will the new dean be also, et cetera. Same for you, Stephen. So, and, and this, and so this is happening. But be free, talk about it, be frank about it. Uh, and, and make it uh, explicit, and, and uh, again, listen, listen, listen to where are your worries? Uh, is it resistance? No, it is a real worry, it is a real concern, and I just pointed out some of the things. That helps a lot, but it takes an enormous amount of time and energy to get this going, because it's culture, it's all about culture. And, and it, yeah, it, some people just don't like the change, for good reasons. And anyone else wanna tackle roadblocks? <coughs> Sandy? You know, so at, 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 at UT Southwestern, I said that the chairs have autonomy in, in, in identifying people they want to recruit and who they're going to recruit. But our recruitment funds come from a wonderful philanthropy and something called an endowed scholar program where there's an institutional committee 
that then uh, decides, I happen to be on the committee, but that then decides of the, of the candidates that are put forward by each department, which ones are going to get the, the uh, uh, philanthropic startup package. And um, I'm afraid that, speaking out of class, and I might get in trouble here, that process is uh, much less transparent. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's, uh, it's not clear how individuals and what criteria, by what criteria, uh, the individuals are making the decision as to uh, who is going to be an, an endowed scholar. And I think you know that's my next battle uh, on on the campus is is talking to uh, my very distinguished uh, senior colleagues uh, that serve on that committee um, uh, about really spelling out and discussing. I think transparency, we talked about transparency and, and, and discussions and uh, uh, being clear about what the expectations are. And, I, and I'm afraid we haven't done that and, and that is my next battle. Yeah, I can say a little bit about our challenges. So using last night's nomenclature, Richmond is a solidly category B institution. So we're bachelor's degree granting but who are faculty at category B institutions? People that were trained at category R institutions. So the discussions early on, and I think historically at our institution when you're looking at job candidates, people get super excited about amazing research projects at places with lots of resources that aren't necessarily the resources that our institution has. So I think our department had a track record of getting excited about candidates with quality research that, like you were saying, didn't necessarily do all of the other things or have track records in all of the other things that they do, and it was just assumed that they would just pick the stuff up on the job. Um, and that's not what was happening. So it was taking some time to recalibrate how we were describing and talking about what strong research candidates would look like for our institution because it took time to adjust to what we actually meant by a, a strong research candidate. Mm -hmm because it wasn't the same thing that the rest of the world meant. All right, very good. So we have uh, questions going across here. We can start at the side of the room. Um, just very quickly, I'm curious whether, uh, to what degree do you give search committees implicit bias training? Hmm. So does, anyone, does anyone do implicit bias training? This is a particularly, I think, more US focused kind of well, thing, but maybe you do it in yeah, Europe right. as well. But, but yeah, I'm on the search committees for deans and chairs, uh, deans, uh, chair of medicine, the dean of our faculty. Uh, and there, at that level, we, we absolutely did Im, uh, in, implicit sure. bias training. Implicit bias training. Bias training? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. so. Some, but not enough. Mm -hmm. I, so I would also say, so at my institution, there was always one person who took the implicit bias training on the search committee, and that is flawed. Mm -hmm. um, They've expanded this recently where now all members of the search committee take implicit bias training. And I actually am not, I don't think that solves the problem. Um, I think that you need institutional change and you need institutional practices that back up the implicit bias training. Um, because I think if you rely on implicit bias training, that sort of the implication is, is that there's nothing wrong with our practices. That's just something that those are in, these are individual decisions. But individual decisions are made in response to institutional incentives. And so we need to change our institutional incentives. We need to change our institutional practices so that they are actually much more inclusive. And we need to stop talking about implicit bias as being the only reason why we have less diverse candidates. We make decisions about who to invite. We make decisions about who to evaluate. And that is not all because of implicit bias. I mean, and I hate to say this about faculty, there is a lot of explicit bias in faculty. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, I am incredibly proud, and I, you know, I am incredibly proud to be a faculty member. I am incredibly lucky to be a faculty member, but it is incredibly frustrating to not have that conversation. Very good. So thank you. So. Okay, um, Andrew Campbell from Brown University. I guess I have to say I'm I'm uh, sort of positively struck by what uh, Sandy said about hiring practices at um, UT Southwestern, the involvement of junior faculty, and also. Omar, um, the practices uh, where, you, uh, where you're at. And I guess my question is, do uh, you think that's enough? What about the involvement of graduate students? I mean, if you think about the individuals who will be the up and coming next generation of scholars 
And when you think about the hiring, particularly of junior faculty, I think the greatest exposure um, that graduate students will have will be to these individuals. And so you know, I see their value also when it comes to hiring. There are certain things that I think they bring to the whole process. Uh, I think they also uh, can contribute to the reappointment process. Now, I'm still working, and I need to be convinced about the tenure process, because when you think about tenure, you're talking about faculty who are going to be at an institution for some 35 plus years. Um, students tend to be more transient. And so I think those decisions require a little more. But I think certainly the importance of students, graduate and undergraduates, I think mm -hmm. is something that really shouldn't be ignored, because you know they should have a, a voice. What you're describing is something that's sort of like shared governance, but it's not really truly shared governance for everyone who's part of that community. Mm -hmm. So I think the students should really have some say. So I don't know what your response to that would be. Uh, maybe two comments. One is uh, uh, students and postdocs are certainly involved in the recruitment process, again, uh, with permission from the candidates, uh, and all have given permission so far, but I do ask them. Uh, I invite postdocs to the chalk talks uh, because it gives them a chance to see what a chalk talk is and, and, and to participate in, uh, uh, in that. So uh, uh, the faculties all have lunches with students and postdocs. And I think the students and postdocs can, have, can really influence recruitment, so they may not have a ch choice of the, of the candidate, but they certainly can be persuasive to the candidate as to whether they're going to accept the offer. In terms of tenure, um, I laid out very clearly what, what my criteria are for tenure, and there was scholarship and mentorship, because you, you, when you give somebody tenure, you're looking for sustained excellence, and if that person hasn't demonstrated that they can attract train and, and have their trainees flourish in their groups, if that hasn't been clearly demonstrated, then I see no opportunity for them to have a sustainably productive research career. So mentorship is key and, and the feedback from students and postdocs in that group are key. Uh, and I make that explicit to, to, to promotion um, decisions. I have about three minutes left. Okay. Okay. So I do want to, I, I do want to get to a couple more questions. So I want to kind of go a little more lightning around. There's a lot of time for discussion. Um, but just to kind of get the questions out in the room. So I'm hoping to get maybe two more questions in. Um, so we can make them very short and maybe just uh, really short answers and then know that we're going into a discussion period next. We'll have more chance to talk. So I'm going to do over here. CSF, a uh, question for Needy, but a couple other people may want to comment as well. You, you spoke, so I, I think it's awesome that junior faculty are included in, in uh, tenure decisions. Um, uh, you're immersed in a big system. Um, is, it, is, is that the policy across UCSC campus? No. Um, and uh, of course, there's a committee on academic personnel on your campus that ultimately makes the decisions. Right. Is your feeling that the department decision is, is one that just carries through the cap as a rubber stamp? Uh, you're also immersed in a 10 campus system that mm -hmm. has its own academic personnel manual that has criteria that are out, laid out. Sandy knows this very well, have yep. through that system. So, so how do you feel about your level of autonomy in making these decisions, and if it's if if you have a response, feel a responsibility to try to um, uh, infect the rest of your campus uh, and the system wide overall in terms of, of sit, being able to adhere to these kinds of standards. Um, so anybody who has met me knows that I am a fan of proselytizing, and um, I this I would absolutely love to do this, and so to have more departments do this. I, I actually recently wrote a perspective about how to increase equity during faculty hiring and tenure and promotion. And one of the things that I highlight in that is the fact that having assistant professors being involved in the process, in the tenure process, is a major way to contribute to transparency and consistency, especially because underrepresented minorities, if there's a barrier to hiring, there's also a barrier to retention. And so, if people are concerned about tenure as a moving target, then being involved in the process eliminates some of, some of that concern. Um, to tell you the truth, I had not even considered the, pro the possibility of having this conversation at the UCSC level, having this conversation at the UCOP level, and all of these things. I mean, I actually don't know how to do that. Um, and if you can provide any guidance, I would be happy to. <laughs> 
do this in that same system. So yeah, exactly. So collaboration. And then the final quick, we're like one minute, but I'd love to get this last question in, so please. Yeah, so hi, my name is Olivia Rislin. I'm at the University of Colorado, and I had a question in terms of after some of these policies are enacted, how do you evaluate how effective they are, both in terms of unintended consequences, in terms of have you actually lived up to the values that you're trying to change, and also in terms of how do you perhaps generate some data that you could use to convince more conservative uh, faculty members? So great, great closer question there around evaluation, because we've heard some. So has anyone done evaluation? And I think, Miriam, maybe you have done, you have um, an example of that. Well, we set up an evaluation, like since after the pilot phase now, and we start with the intervention, we have a rollout, and we are planning so that to attend over 60% of all hiring commissions. And we, um, we, we have the data, we anonymize them, and um, we also get all the protocols, and we will follow up on the protocols how often the new items are mentioned in the protocols regarding decision making in putting somebody on the short list or later on even doing deliberations. We take notes from the hiring commissions that we, we, um, we attend as um, more process notes, there's nothing that we can publish because this is highly confidential, but we do, we will be able when hiring commissions are closed uh, to anonymously report on um, the uptake uh, on, the, on the new items and at least internally if we are allowed to report that to the outside, we don't know yet, but yeah. And then Frank, uh, just 15, very briefly. 15 seconds. So we uh, collaborate with the, science, the, the Center for Science and Technology Studies in Leiden, and they have four PhDs, and they are on the ground in our system, and uh, they started three years ago. And they look at, uh, they are in committees, and they, they do this discourse analysis and real sociological studies on how this is perceived in, at every level, from the board down to the parking lot, more or less. And, uh, and they are writing these up, and some, ha some of it has already been published by Sarah de Rijke. And this is really helpful for us also to see, are we also s selecting and promoting other professors? Are we really, how are people discussing uh, if the dean is not in the room? So wonderful. So I know that we could keep going for quite a while. There's a re really rich discussion, but we do need to move on to the next agenda item. So thank you for all of you that are out there on the internet that joined us to listen. And for those of you in the room, you will, we're gonna move into breakout sessions, so this is a great chance for us all to talk amongst ourselves. And you will see assignments in the agenda, to, so take a look to know where to go next. Ooh. And I would just like to thank all of our panelists for sharing, so thank you so much. Yeah, thank you guys, great job.